great. Um, and great. it's my um, 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 So yeah, welcome to Matthew Patterson from Politics and um, the Sustainable Consumption Institute. Um, and perhaps I'll just let you let you start it off, introduce it yourself. Sure. Uh, so yeah, maybe I'll just say very briefly what what makes me tick, if you like. Uh, as an academic, I've been basically studying, following on and off climate change negotiations in the UN since 1989. Um, I did an undergraduate dissertation on it in that year, and then I did a PhD start, follow the negotiations through to the UNFCCC signing. So I'll be, so I'm not a, I'm not what um, some of the slightly disparaging call a, a, a cop junkie. I don't go very often, but I've been going for a long time, and it's sort of, so what, so that sort of colours, I think, what I'm going to try and say. Um, so, so I'm not going to do much by way of like evaluation of whether or not the COP decisions were adequate or not. I think it's fairly obvious that they're not. Um, that's sort of a fairly straightforward observation. But what I'm going to try and do is sort of start a bit by um, ex uh, explaining how I see why people have been so disappointed and how we need to understand why the outcome is not what people thought it might be and hoped it might be. And then also highlight some things in the outcomes of COP that seem to me to be quite useful and to think about in terms of focusing attention, whether that's campaigning or research or various sorts of activity that people in the university might be interested in doing and, and that might be useful and where they and maybe highlighting what seem to be things where that where we can see plausible trajectories for higher ambition. So I'll share my screen now. Um, so, uh, uh, I hope everyone can see that. Um, so this seems to me to be one way of thinking that. So uh, is that you've got three pictures from COP26. I didn't take these. These are just stolen off Google Images. Apologies, they're not, not attributed. But I think what I'm going to say is that it's really useful to understand that these three aspects are quite different and 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 shaped how we understand and separate them out clearly. So, uh, where's my, why is that not going to work? Is that? Yeah, so essentially down on the bottom left, you've got the really, really uh, nitty gritty uh, negotiations within the context of the formal legal process of the UNFCCC. Um, in the middle of that picture is Patricia Espinoza, who's the executive secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So essentially the chief administrator for the whole process. Um, if you were watching the, the negotiations right at the end while Ak Sharma was you know, leading all that thing on the Saturday afternoon, she was almost entirely sat next to him telling him what he could and couldn't do and how the process had to work. Um, uh, and, and so one part of the COP is just these formal negotiations. If you sit in those, they're incredibly quiet rooms. Everybody's just speaking to a mic. Um, everybody's, uh, there's there's a, either a loudspeaker or people got headsets on if they listen to it in translation. They'd be simultaneously translated in all, into all UN languages for the most part. Um, they're very dry and technical um, and they're what produced most of the decisions that were then announced on the Saturday afternoon. Um, the second part of COP though, which is, which is the top right, uh, exemplifies is that you have it's essentially what a cop is a massive business fair and jamboree. Um, it, what you probably saw and what got highlighted in the news is that, which the British government was very, very effective at getting the, the media to focus on, is they organised it into days. So there's an energy day and a finance day and a forests day and a cars day and so on, a transport day. Uh, and so on. And they had a big splashy announcement, and this was deliberately orchestrated to have a big splashy announcement of something that they thought felt quite ambitious on any of those issues, you know, the phasing out of coal or the, um, you know, really accelerating electric vehicle take up or, you know, whatever it might be, ending deforestation and so on. Um, and it, within the cop, it, within the cop venue itself, you've then got all these other, you've got a whole load of sort of business fair booths, pavilions, where governments and businesses and some NGOs are promoting um, new in, their own initiatives, um, organising side events, doing various things that generate energy about what what they think can be done. This is a this was 
the, the, the racing car you see there is a ele fully electric Formula One level racing car, um, which, the, which sat there right in the middle, sort of exemplifying that this sort of aspect of the COP is all about hype and giving this sense of energy and ambition and so on. Um, whether or not we want electric vehicle Formula One cars is a separate question, but that sort of tells us a lot about how that bit of the COP works. And then, of course, there's a protest and social movement pressure that many, some some people on the call may have been up in Glasgow, they may have gone to the Manchester one as well. Instead, um, we're um, focused on trying to get, uh, you know, really focused on trying to get higher ambition and trying to, you know, keep you know, keep the pressure on to keep within, um, to get to net zero, to, to keep within 1.5 degrees or however that's understood. And these are all interacting, but they're not the same thing. And I think one of the things that seems to me that happened is that both the uh, version two and version three gave this sense of this huge amount of energy. I mean, you did get a sense of loads and loads of announcements, loads and loads of sense of ambition. On the second one, you had a few, and you had an announcement during the first week where the International Energy Agency said, oh, if, if governments and business do all of these things that they say will do, the Glasgow Finance Alliance, the net zero, or getting rid of coal or whatever it was, then we could uh, keep warming within 1.8 degrees. Um, so it was this sense that, well, maybe we're in a way, maybe, we, well, maybe we're getting that sort of uh, level of ambition. There was a report the next week uh, from Climate Action Tracker saying, actually, you know, if they did it all, it'd be more like 2.4 degrees, which is a lot more alarming. But, but nevertheless, there was this sense of, you know, the, the formal stuff going on in the treaty negotiations actually isn't the only story. There's all this other stuff as well. It won't be written into the treaty, but could go somewhere interesting. And of course, the protest and social movement pressure is all about upping the ambition and in some senses was driven by the expectations of what COP26 might, COP might achieve, was driven just by a general sense of the climate emergency and saying we've got to do better, we've got to keep within 1.5 and so on. So it's completely detached, if you like, from the formal nitty gritty of what's going on in these diplomatic negotiations. So in the diplomatic negotiations, what COP was supposed to do in terms of the logic of the Paris Agreement was agree what they call the Paris rule book, which is a series of detailed rules that they didn't tie down in Paris and hadn't tied down since. Most of those are about carbon markets, which I'll come to in a second. And Robbie's on the call, so he could say lots about those as well. Um, um, uh, launch a thing called the global stop take, which is basically saying if we add up all the commitments that governments have, meant, uh, have, kept, have, have made within the context of the Paris Agreement, not these flashy ambitious alliances and stuff, but just the commitments within the Paris Agreement, what they call their na uh, nationally determined contributions, do they all add up to 1.5? Sure, the, it's a bit of a weird process because the answer is obviously no, but, and nobody thinks it's no, but then there's going to be this two year process which Glasgow launched. And then the other one was, it just received and had some discussion of these revised national determined contributions. And it did all those things, actually. So Paris, in some sense, some senses, Glasgow was actually, in that formal, narrow sense, it was a great success. It actually did exactly what it was supposed to do. I was really surprised that the car market rules were actually agreed, that the meetings I went to in the first week, I thought those positions are still miles apart, but they agreed it by the end anyway. So there were a number of ways, and there's a number of ways also. Uh, yeah, anyway, so, so it's in the formal sense, they did what they were supposed to do. Uh, the set, sense of greater expectations that maybe you should be doing lots more was coming from outside the formal, outside this, what I'm calling COP version one here. Um, so let's, so what are the implications of that and uh, in terms of what we might pay attention to over the next year? Uh, well, a few years or whenever. So within the formal bit, it seems to me that the, the most important, probably the most important thing, well, the two most important things to pay, pay attention to are this carbon market stuff and then these annual NDC updates. Um, I've put them there. I've sent this to Sammy as well. I think you can send around the portfolios afterwards because there's all hyperlinks if anybody wants to get really nerdy and, and read all these things. Um, so what, a little bit of context. So in the, the predecessor to the Paris Agreement, the Kyoto Protocol, um, from 1997, a central bit of that was a series of mechanisms to say countries can essentially meet their obligations under the protocol by 
trading those emissions rights in various ways with other countries, right? So for example, the UK could invest, if it's not meeting its targets, um, that wasn't true, the UK overshot its target by quite a long way, but let's, well, let's say the other way around, the UK overshot its target, actually reduced its emissions more than it was required to under the Kyoto Protocol. It would have some surplus permits that it could sell to other countries that find it more difficult, let's say Canada or Japan, which didn't meet its target although it was closer than Canada was. Um, and the second mechanism was called the Clean Development Mechanism, where a country like the UK could invest in a project, let's say a renewable energy project in India, and get some credit against its own obligation to reduce its emissions. Um, and the underlying logic is, well, the atmosphere doesn't really care whether the emissions get reduced, it just cares that they get reduced. And there's some sort of rationale for saying, well, it's quite expensive to reduce emissions, so why don't we try and create means of reducing them relatively cheaply? And so that's that was already well established. Um, most commentate, whatever we think of whether it was environmentally effect effective, the, especially the clean development mechanisms were very, very popular. It generated loads more projects than anybody thought previously there would be. Um, certainly seen some figure of somebody saying uh, it, it traded, it produced about five times as many projects as we thought it would beforehand. Um, so it's very popular amongst negotiators. It's very popular uh, amongst, amongst financiers, business and so on. It's also very popular amongst a lot of countries, not everywhere, but a lot of countries in the global south, because it generates investment in low carbon energy. And so what we've ended up in the in the Paris Agreement is, however, is that they wanted to reproduce all of these, the similar mechanisms. But the problem is that the Paris Agreement design is completely different to the current Kyoto Protocol. So under the Kyoto Protocol, states, rich states, industrialized country states like, like the UK, had written in the target, we will reduce our emissions in, in the UK's case, well, as part of an EU bubble, you, uh, EU said, we will reduce our emissions by 8%. And that's written into the treaty. Whereas in the Paris Agreement, it just says every country will do one of these NDCs, which will say what it's going to achieve. So each country sets its own targets, not written into the treaty. They're supposed to then come back every three years or so with a new version of this NDC, this, this commitment or set of commitments. But there's not even any standardization of what those commitments have to look like. Right. So some countries will have a fixed target and say we'll reduce our emissions by, uh, well, like the UK target, we will be net zero by 2050. Um, or, you know, and other countries have, there's a reasonable number of countries right now with that sort of target built in, uh, and they will then have shorter term targets, let's say for 2030, our emissions will have gone down by whatever the number is. Others just sit there and don't have any of those targets at all. They just say, you know, uh, we're going to, we're going to enact this policy, we'll do a carbon tax and we'll focus on energy efficiency and so on. So there's a huge variation of types of commitments that are written into those documents. And so then the question is, well, how do you, and the reason why it took them six years to agree these rules is that, well, how do you create one of these two types of trading mechanisms um, when there isn't the sort of same level of clarity about what government's going to do? Um, and so that's why, it, that's why it took a lot longer. That took, or took a long time to agree the um, the rules, uh, there's other reasons as well, but that'll do for the moment. Um, but what we end up with is Article 6.2 creates this emissions trading possibility and the unit and those things are called ITMOs, which stands for internationally traded mit tradable mitigation outcomes. And so the idea there would be let, it's similar in principle, let, let's say the UK says it's going to get to net zero, but it could sit there and uh, work out bilaterally with some other country a way of trading those between them. Uh, so that something, some action somewhere else counts towards the UK's sense of being net zero. Um, and the Article 6.4 is the one that creates, I, I, I think it's brilliant that they've just not given it a name, it's called The Mechanism, which sounds like it's a sort of uh, the Matrix type film sort of name. I can see, I can see Will Smith turning up, you know, to with his black shades on saying, saying, you know, hello, madam, I'm from The Mechanism and, and I've come to, you know, make sure you're doing your um emissions reductions properly um but the um but that's designed to do the re replicate the cdm but again there's lots of us it was like it's really really weird to work out how that's actually going to work um so if you do click on those links you'll find 
the most impenetrable text you have ever ever read. Well, no, I'm sure somebody's read some really impenetrable bit of philosophy that will be that will that will match it. But it's really hard to work out exactly what this means. And there's a load of possibilities for really big loopholes. Um, and especially when you think that if nationally, if countries are now being asked to revise their nationally determined contributions every year, which is the sort of they did sort of decide in Glasgow, then at the moment you are revising this and you're supposed to be getting more ambitious over time, you also know you've got all these projects in gone going on that might generate credits for you. And so you're going to just going to gain the target to account for the credits. Whereas in Kyoto, it was much harder to do that because you have the target set in 1997. That didn't change. You were doing the projects much later. So you couldn't set your target in function of what you were going to be able to do with these projects. So there's all sorts of possibilities for weirdness going on there that needs a bit of paying attention to. But, and I think campaigners and research organisations and so on could be really important to, to paying attention to those details. Um, the second one is to pay attention to the global stock take itself and just follow it, I think, see what it says, see how it unfolds. I don't think anybody knows. It's the first time it's done. Nobody really knows how that's going to unfold. And the second one is just paying attention to how countries are developing their NDCs. I think the key resource there is this thing called Climate Action Tracker. Um, they do quite a lot of really good work on just following that and working out Who's you know they go the little scores of who's who's NDCs in this they've had two now basically an initial one and a revised one who's actually got more ambitious to over time who has not um, and and which bits uh, you know which in what ways they're getting better in what ways they still need more work so I think those on within the formal stuff that's I think worth us paying attention to as people involved in universities where we could do either campaigning or research or combinations of both and then. On the on the what I'm what I call COP version two, I, I'm just going to highlight three. There were loads of initiatives here, but I'm going to highlight three partly because I think they're maybe some of the more either the more promising ones or or the most where uh, where people involved in universities might be able to really dig around and do some muckraking and find out what's actually happening in, in attempting to implement them. So the first of these is the Glasgow Finance Alliance for Net Zero, which Rishi Sunak announced, I think, on the Wednesday of week two, uh, week one. Um, and, and this, in principle, it's basically the whole, you know, pretty much the entirety of the financial institutions in the world economy have sort of signed on to saying we're going to stop funding, we're going to be shifting our finance towards pursuing net zero. Um, the problem is, is what we, there has been a lot of financial initiatives on climate over the last 20 odd years, 20, 25 years. Um, there's not a lot of evidence that, it's had, that they've had much effect on actually shifting financial flows. Um, so the devil is really in the detail and there's a lot of chance for sort of, again, well, simple bullshit, really. Um, so tracking, I mean, one of, the, one of the key things for big, big financial organisations, banks, insurance companies, hedge funds, all of that, is that the gap between the CEO and the, and the sustainability officer who will have made, signed up to all of these, these pledges and the day-to-day -day fund management decisions um, is really, really big. If you like this, just from a sociological point of view about these big financial organisations, it's a bit like within a university that what Nancy says and what I do in the classroom may or may not be aligned, but there's obviously not any direct control. So Nancy might say all sorts of wonderful, or senior management might say all sorts of wonderful things about what we're doing in the classroom or what our research is doing. And actually that's, you know, she's not in a position to actually determine that just because it's a large organization and big financial organizations are the same. And the incentive structures, if you like, for the fund managers are still for the most part, short-term returns on investment. Uh, uh, you know, lots of other things, for example, pension funds, right? So my pension is is partly, you know, is, is, is embedded in all of that. Um, so tracking where the money actually flows rather than whether they say they will be sending the money. Um, uh, and, and also, I think, are you sort of, when we, I was in a meeting while this and we were asking and, and they just could not answer it. But when you, if you are in meetings with people from finance and they say that, then, then just say, what is your business model? And what, what expected, if you're going to shift your money to net zero, what's your expected rate of return on that investment? And is it the same as what you're getting out of coal and oil and gas? Uh, on oil, it's almost certain to be not true if they say we're going to get the same rate of return because they get, they're still getting 
eight or nine percent a year rate of return on oil and gas investments and solar doesn't get close to matching that rate of return so there's a you know simple questions about whether or not they're doing that i think are worth us thinking about being able to do the second one and this is actually in some ways i think the most promising one is this power and plus coal alliance so that was established in uh about three years ago four years ago by uk uk and canada um so at that point it looked like okay these are two countries that are more or less already got themselves out of coal in electricity anyway right we, we now uk is down to seven percent of its electricity coming from coal six seven percent canada pretty much similar in fact if anything slightly less possibly um so and they both had phase out plans um, now, however, and in Glasgow, what was quite interesting is that you've got lots of countries that for, the, for whom that's not true. Right? Poland has joined it, Ukraine has joined it, Indonesia has joined it. All of these are traditionally have still got quite a lot of coal, but have said they're going to try and get it. So we could be inter doing interesting work tracking whether they get out of coal, how quickly they get out of coal, do more countries join over time, what is covered, are they only talking about coal in electricity production, or is it also coal extraction? So. Australia, for example, didn't sign up to this power and gas coal. They're very unlikely to do so anytime soon. They have said that they're going that, that they were happy with the phase out of coal, which is the thing that India blocked on that last day and switched to phase down. Um, but Australia was very clear that well, and maybe they'll end up with no coal and no electricity, but they're still totally in, in, envisaging mining coal and selling it to other people who would be burning it in power stations. So it's, you know, what is covered in this phase out of coal when a country signs up to it is mean. Um, but I think nevertheless, that's, there's something promised there. And I'll come to a, I'll just show quickly a slide in a minute on that. And then the third one is this very new one, Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, which was formed by or led by Denmark and Costa Rica. And that was just formed during COP itself. Um, but where it could be something that becomes, so it's a bit too early to say, but it could be something like the power and gas coal where other countries join in. I'll just show you something on the coal. This isn't the, this is uh, this is some research by E3G, which is a sort of environmental think tank search group. This is just OECD countries, so there are some powering past coal countries that are not here. But this is the sort of tracking which I think I mean they're doing it for this, but there's other ways you could do it as well, where you now where you can see that even if you take if you I don't know how clear it is on your screen, hopefully clear enough. If you, even if you look at the United States. If you just follow how much is going on, right? So the United States is now 23% of its electricity comes from coal. That's way down from even 15 years ago. It would have been more like 50% 15 years ago, I think. I don't know, I have a figure in my head. You can see the arrows that, that those, there's only two countries on that where coal, coal share of electricity is going up uh, in, in the whole of the OECD. Um, that, 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 that next green column says retirements. That's the number of coal plants that have been shut down in the last 10 years uh, and the red one two ones over is the number that have been constructed so you can sort of see a pretty you know, that's pretty that's that's a quite optimistic picture to my mind and the numbers over here the gray ones two gray ones at the far end especially the paler gray one that's the number of ones that were going to be built but are not but have now been cancelled so pretty much across the oecd they're just whether or not they're members of this coal power and pass coal membership which is this the green tick or the uh, the red cross on the left coal is dead in in rich countries right so it's sort of there are things there which are quite useful for us to be able to think about if we want to be optimistic but but i think there's loads of work that people in universities could be thinking about how do we build on that sort of knowledge and and, and campaign with it um okay so the last last thing just to say a few things and this is a bit more speculative and uh, and sort of leads into questions that you may very well have. Um, one, I think, point is then to think about these are all rather big, big scale things. How might they articulate with campaigns or research or um, activities going on locally, either, either in the university or in Manchester? Um, so, for example, one example is that the university does have a net zero ta um, um, target um, allied to the, the Greater Manchester one. Um, I'm not probably not the only person in the room who's been in meetings where it's very clear that it's very clear to me in the meeting I, last meeting I was at that estates and planning, estates management on campus is really conservative about these things. It's mostly conservative, um, it's not unique to Manchester. Um, but I think there could be more that we could do there to think about. Okay, well if we're going, if there are other 
if there's some of these global initiatives, could we be thinking about, okay, well, if there are financial institutions who really want to fund net zero, is there a piece of the pie that we can, is there a way that we can try and articulate with that or that type of question? Just as one example, uh, I just had a, uh, you know, could we look at other universities which are doing way more and work out how they've done it um, uh, and learn from that? The example I give there is because I used to work at the University of Ottawa in Canada. Um, and I, I don't know exactly how reliable these figures are. These are fairly quickly produced. You could do it more systematically. You know, so it's about the same size as Manchester, about 40 or thousand students. So a similar size cam uh, campus and university. Obviously the climate conditions are radically different. Um, the daily high temperature in January there is minus seven. It goes down to below minus 20 most nights or very regularly. Uh, in the summer, it's more like 28, 29 degrees rather than sort of 19, 20, 21 or something. Um, but nevertheless, the, 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 the total amount of uh, electricity consumed on campus is slightly lower in, Man in Ottawa than in Manchester. And I know that they had very, very systematic over 30 odd years energy management, deep energy retrofitting buildings to get it to that sort of a number. Um, anyway, so I think there's lots we could learn there, even if that actual number doesn't look quite as sharp as it might. I think if you looked at some, there might be some other UK universities where you know, the per capita energy consumption on campus might be considerably lower than Manchester. I'd be really surprised if that's not true. Um, there is, I mean, there are other possible things, it seems to me, I, I think across some parts of Greater Manchester, and not obviously in the city, that was banned in the 1950s, uh, but in some of the smaller towns, they'll still be allowed uh, domestic coal burning. Can we do anything about that? Uh, if we were campaigning across the city, um, connect that to the power and pass coal story. Um, is there, uh, I mean, Manchester's obviously a site of huge investment in real estate and has been for 25 years. Um, much of that will be coming from these exact financial institutions that have just said they're going to be, they're, they're trying to fund net zero. Um, could we be tracking how that actually plays out in practice with the investments that are going on now? Is it, are they building net zero buildings, net carbon, you know, carbon zero buildings? I doubt it, but that could be sort of interesting to track. Um, and so it seems to me actually what, what a lot of us might be interested in, you know, researching, tracking those, those what I've called COP version two initiatives, all the hype and the big initiative and so on, might be really interesting. And then some sorts of campaign work that might connect to, to that. You've probably got loads of questions. I'm happy to either talk more about nerdy stuff to do with you in FCCC or uh, other things. And I'll stop there because it says 25 minutes. Great. Thank you, Matthew. I'll, um, I'll stop sharing.